We question our daily position Seeking answers and definitions Get the queries of your chest With Ahkam SOS Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Welcome to Ahkam SOS The show that discusses Islamic duties and practices this is a live show, and if you have a question that you'd like to ask us, send us your questions via the WhatsApp number. Um, alternatively, give us an email at, at uh, ahkamsos at imamhussain.tv or give us a call here in the studio live, and inshallah, me and the Sheikh will be able to discuss and answer your questions. I'm your host, Mohsin Shah, and joining me is Sheikh Ali Marsh. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. How are you doing this evening? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, Sheikhna. Sheikh as you know, every episode we have you know, a list of questions and on different random topics. Let us begin with, well, I was going to say partnership, but it's more to do with you know, sharing property and so forth. So if one individual surrenders his land or you know, leases out his land to someone who plants trees and so forth, uh, and you know, when it comes to the, the, the fruit and the harvest of these trees, does the landowner, does he have a share in it? أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على عدائهم أجمعين um, This type of transaction is known as مغارسة okay. which means uh, tree plantation um, uh, scheme or deal or transaction in which both come together. One is giving this uh, piece of land, you know, hiring this land to this individual, and the other would harvest, would uh, plant uh, and harvest uh, the, the fruits and the vegetables and so forth. And of course, this is a, a valid, uh, a valid um, transaction. It is allowed. But it all depends on the agreement between the two sides, you know, if that individual invested something, for example, in this land, then he gets a share. So it depends on the, the deal and agreement between the two sides. I see. I see. Excellent. Sheikh now, according to His Eminence, the Grand Ayatollah, Sheikh Bashir al Najafi, when it comes to an individual who's performing world war, and let's say he's performing uh, the part where you wash your arms and he's doing his right arm, he knows he's performed the action, but he's not sure, did I do it properly? Did I, you know, was it from the top of the elbow all the way down to the fingertip? Did I miss any part? Did I go the opposite direction, which I shouldn't have? Um, and he's still performing his wudu. What does an individual do in that situation? As long as he is still in the wudu process, he needs to repeat the act correctly. So if he thinks that he did his uh, right arm uh, wash uh, in a... Uh, incorrect way, then he needs to correct it, do the wudu again in the right arm, and then continue with his wudu to the end. Okay. And that which can uh, allow him to uh, start the salah. I see, excellent. Shaykhna, transactions and paying for, for items and so forth, if I was to perform ghusl, I need to perform ghusl. I go to a public bath, and as you are aware, public baths, you have to pay a fee for it. If I use money, مثلاً, that was from haram source, whether I stole the money or maybe I haven't paid khums, I'm eligible to pay khums, I haven't paid my khums, I use that money to pay to do my ghusl uh, in the public bath. Is my ghusl valid or is it batil? You see, the ghusl would be batil, uh, especially if somebody doesn't want to pay the fee for the, for the bath. Um, and this was in the old times when they had public baths uh, in each area because uh, in those days they didn't have running water mm -hmm. in every house. So they had public baths. Yes. Um, so for the individual to go there and to have a bath without paying the fee, then that would constitute to uh, an invalid ghusl, the wajib ghusl. Um, unless the owner of the bath would uh, accept not to get the payment, so that would be fine. Then the the, the ghusl is, is is valid. Otherwise, it's invalid. Uh, I think we have similar 
scenarios in this time where you have the gym and you have the uh, mm -hmm. swimming pools, for example, yeah. and you have the, uh, the showers. Mm -hmm. So if somebody uh, goes inside uh, those premises and uses and takes a shower for, with the intention of ghusl, the wajib ghusl, and he doesn't pay the fee, we have similar issues in here as oh, well. So you can actually compare the situation with, with today's uh, mm -hmm. uh, situation. So the one should pay the, uh, the fee to the owner in order to get to have this ghusl, which is an obligatory ghusl for, for the purpose of salah and such like, uh, to be valid. Otherwise, there's a problem with it. Sheikhna, the, the most the Husseiniya, the, you know, the Islamic centers that we have, um, we, part of our job is to do tabligh and also to educate people about our religions. So what is the ruling in regards to non-Muslims, whether they are kitabi or non-kitabi, to come to our centers in order for them to, to learn more uh, and understand our religion better? Are they allowed to actually attend and come in? You see, we can actually meet with them and discuss this issue with them and um, guide them through other means, not necessarily to come to our centers or to the mosques, for example. Uh, of course, there's a difference between the Islamic centers and mosques. If the place is mosque, then there's a special ahkam for the mosques uh, other than the centers. Um, I mean, yes, if they are non-Muslims, they can't enter the mosques. And there are reasons for it. But not to forget that even Muslims, in some cases, they're not allowed to uh, enter those mosques, the holy places such as a Muslim who is in the state of Janaba, mm -hmm. the woman who is in the state of the okay. monthly cycle. Mm -hmm. She is not allowed and he's not allowed to enter into the mosque unless they are purified. Correct. So even for the non-Muslims to enter these places, they have to be purified by the purification of Islam mm -hmm. and the Aqidah, the true uh, guided, guided uh, Aqidah. So even the Muslims, so we have the same issue as well, that you have to do the Ghusl Wajib to be able to enter the the Holy Mosque, let's say the Medina or Mecca. Otherwise, you can't even mm. pass through those two holy uh, uh, sites and mosques with the state of Janaba, for example. So we have other means. Now we have the technology. You can talk to them you know, through, through the Skype and, yes. and, and so forth and you know, send the information by the Internet, uh, let's say, uh, with files, let's say, uh, PDF and so forth. Uh, and gradually they can come through and then, of course, if there's a necessity then, that's a different issue, of course. Sheikh, we were just discussing before earlier in regards to gyms and swimming pools and, and, and things like that. As a male, uh, a practicing Muslim man, some of these gyms that we attend are, you know, mixed genders. So when we go there, we will see, uh, you know, ladies there. Um, as a Muslim man, what is the ruling for us? Because some of these ladies are not appropriately dressed uh, in what we would call modest, um, not saying that these women are not modest. The thing is that you know, w w women that attend to the gym have a different attire to wear when they want, want to have a workout and so forth. So, what is the ruling for us males who are practicing Muslims to go to mixed gender gyms? And furthermore, what's the ruling if the, the gentleman, the man, the, the Muslim brother, he doesn't look with lust or in, you know at these people? Maybe he lowers his gaze or he he tries to not look in the direction of where there are women who, who are actually you know, performing their workout and so forth? Um, you see, attending the swimming pools, the mixed ones, where you have the men and women in one pool, uh, and of course dressed, indecently, uh, let's say indecently, or 80-90% revealing. Mm -hmm. revealing. Mm -hmm. uh, revealing the body. Um, it's not permissible, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is an issue in which many of our youth Muslims would not neglect and still attend. The fatwa is clear that uh, such places were is an, an indecently uh, dressed by, uh, let's say, by the, uh, the female side, then uh, if it results, results in the sin and haram, then it's, of course it's not uh, permissible. Um, I even was looking at the, um, the fatwa of Allah Sistani. He said it's absolutely haram to attend in such places, mixed swimming pools. Mm -hmm. So there's no way you can attend. 
because there's always lost temptation around wherever you look. Can you actually refrain from looking? Mm -hmm. Refrain from uh, paying attention to those who are swimming or let's say uh, laying down on the, on, the, on the chairs or floors, for example, uh, with their uh, you know, uh, revealed body, most, most of it. So um, as a precaution, even the Sayyid mentions here that uh, to avoid even um, going to such places even without uh, committing a sin. Mm -hmm. Because these places usually in, uh, attract the one towards the act of sin. It's an inappropriate place to go there. I know there's a need for swimming, that's something for the well-being of the individual, but I have seen, to be honest, some uh, non-Muslims, such as the, the Jewish community, they have tried to rent out an hour a week, mm -hmm. or at least an hour to two hours a week, uh, from the swimming pool, local ones, mm. uh, to have only men, oh, same gender. men men's session and women's session, session yeah. separately. Mm -hmm. We can do the same. We can ask our local gym and swimming pool to have, to give us a slot uh, a week gentlemen uh, and for the gentlemen and for the ladies as well. Because even our sisters in our uh, ladies and Muslim elites, they need also uh, the swimming pool. Yeah. So this is the right as well. So th I think this is the best option and method is to create uh, a decent environment, a halal environment mm -hmm. for our youth and for our elderly as well and for our sisters as well. Shaykh, what about like, you know, in the workplace, uh, you know, schools and universities and such alike, um, you know, because it's very, very difficult here in the West especially to not have a mixed gathering. Um, you know, we go on the buses, it's mixed. You go into a shopping mall or a restaurant, or so it's always mixed. So according to His Eminence, Sayyid Sistani, Grand Ayatollah Sayyid Sistani, Allah, what is the hukum here? Are we actually allowed to work with mixed, uh, with some, you know, opposite genders in, in the office? I mean, yes, if there is no fear in uh, falling into the act of sin haram, that's fine. I mean, uh, we go to the Hajj, for example, we meet uh, in the same tawaf, there's a uh, men and women, for example, uh, in other public places, uh, at work as well. But we have to make sure in, at all levels, we respect the modesty and the chastity and the hijab issue of the uh, women and even the men. They should also protect uh, their modesty and chastity and when they come with the opposite gender. Both sides should respect each other's uh, um, affairs. So we shouldn't breach this um, red line of haram by, for example, uh, cracking jokes which leads to the haram uh, conversation and looking and so forth. So we have to avoid anything that leads to the haram. But normally you just sit down at your work, you know, everyone is busy in his work. That should be, have no issue uh, as long as there's no haram involved in this uh, workplace. Shaykh, now speaking of work and, you know, transactions, if one person was to lend someone um, something, is he allowed to ask for more back before so let's say if somebody wants to borrow 10 kg of flour. Uh, so Mr. B wants flour from Mr. A. Mr. A says, I'll give you 10 kg, but I want 12 kg back in return. This sort of transaction, is this valid when it comes to Islamic Sharia? That is definitely usury or riba. Imagine that if I tell you I'll give you uh, 10 kilograms of uh, basmati rice, long grain, uh, best quality, uh, but in return of, let's say, 15 kilograms of the short grain, low quality rice, then that extra five kilo is riba. Mm -hmm. It's not allowed because it's been weighted. So the, the yes. weight, the weight things that, such as you know, to do with wheat and barley and, and these things, um, you're not allowed to give the difference, sell, uh, exchange in difference. The, the, Excess the, the extra would cause uh, the riba, and same applies with, with gold and silver. When you, when you exchange your gold, make sure you don't exchange it. You know, I'm giving my golden ring, uh, used one, to buy a new one. 
and I'm, I'm giving my one which is uh, which has more weight in exchange of uh, less weight because that's brand new. Mm -hmm. That's uh, excess is, is, is riba. So we have to make sure that we understand in uh, the hukum of the Sharia with regards to uh, exchange of buying and selling. Speaking of Sharia, Sheikhna, and you know, studying to a level of becoming a mujtahid. Now, our sisters, can they become uh, mujtahids or mujtahidas as they're known as? Um, studying to a level when they can derive Islamic law from themselves using the techniques of usul fiqh as well as referring back to the Quran and the Hadith uh, in order to extrapolate and you know, to form fatawa in accordance to His Eminence, the Grand Ayatollah um, Sheikh uh, Wahid Khorasani, I believe he talks about this. So in general, you know, can a female reach the level of mujtahida where she doesn't need to follow a marja anymore and she can make her own uh, laws in regards to the Sharia? Um, yes, his eminence mentions that she can actually become mujtahida, but she should act upon her own opinions. Mm -hmm. In other words, she, uh, she cannot announce her marja'iyya mm -hmm. and have followers yeah. like other maraja' and ulama in Najaf and Qum. Uh, no, she can't. Uh, she can actually reach that level of ishtihad to uh, act upon her own opinions in this, in this field. And of course, there are reasons for this, that why in Islam a woman cannot become a marja, a jurist, or um, a judge, and so forth. There are reasons given in the books that one can go and refer back to find why does Islam prevents from women to reach such important and pivotal positions uh, in, in Sharia. I guess it's important here to mention also it's not that you know Islam doesn't see women capable of doing so but there are other um, factors taken into account in terms of suitability uh, and, and things like that. Um, inshallah, we'll, that's a discussion for another time. Uh, we're going to go to a break shortly, and inshallah, join us after the break as we continue answering your questions here on Ahkam SOS. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Ahkam SOS, the show that discusses Islamic duties and practices. Just a quick reminder to all our viewers that this is a live show, so if you have a question that you'd like me and the Sheikh to discuss, send your questions in via the WhatsApp, the email address ahkamsos at imamhussain.tv or alternatively give us a call on 0203-515-0199 and inshallah me and the Sheikh will be more than happy to answer and discuss your questions. Assalamu alaikum Sheikh. Assalamu alaikum. Sheikh, the next question is in regards to no access of water. So, we have... A couple, husband and wife, um, he wants to perform wusul, um, there's no water available and, and he wants to go and have marital relations with his wife. Is he allowed to do tayammum instead of ghusl? So tayammum in place of, of the ghusl and then you know go and, and um, see his wife. Is he allowed to do so? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yes, it is permissible for him to actually um, initiate this intercourse uh, relationship while there's no water and even if the salah time has begun uh, and the salah uh, so he does you know after this relationship he would go and do tayammum and start the salah there's no issue with it because this taklif now his uh, duty is to perform the tayammum so that should be no issue with it at all I see Shaykh, we've got a question that's coming via the email. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. I have a question for the Ahkam SOS program. What is the ruling on invoking the spirits of the dead or communicating with them if, they, if that has dire effects on the psychology of the individual and causes harm to individuals, the living and the dead? So here invoking the spirits, trying to speak to those who have passed away um, I'm, I'm sure brothers and sisters have seen it in the films. Maybe they grew up play, playing with Luigi boards and stuff like that. Islamically speaking, here having psychological effects and harm on both the living and the dead. What is the Islamic ruling here? Well, given the scenario here, it is not permissible. You know, any kind of harm is not allowed on an individual. So if that harms them, then it's not allowed. Fair enough. Shaykh is it permissible to say salam to followers of other religions? And what if those other people as well 
say salam to us, how you know, are we allowed to give the reply? I mean, I remember at school, so many uh, of my non-Muslim friends would say salam to each other as well as myself. Um, even you know, at work and things like that, you'll have people who, are, who know, who are cultured and understand the different greetings that different people and different cultures and different backgrounds have and they'll use a separate greeting with, with, with each uh, different individual. So according to his eminence, uh, the late uh, Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi alayhi, what does he say in regards to this? His eminence uh, mentions that yes, uh, it is permissible and also permissible to return the gre greeting to those who greet you uh, from other religions, that's fine. But he would uh, mention that uh, the reply should be by saying the minimum such as alaykum, for example, to, to them. Um, so, yes, you're allowed to greet them. Um, but let me mention two hadiths with regard to greeting each other as believers, as Muslims. Um, this first narration from Imam Ali, alayhi salam, where he stated, As-salam sab'oon hasana saying salam and replying the salam in overall there are 70 rewards and hasana involved but who gets the more mm -hmm. that's the importance uh, 69 is for the one who initiates the salam mm -hmm. the one who says salam alaykum he starts the salam he gets 99 percent of the <laughs> reward mm -hmm. And one hasana gets the one who says Wa alaykum salam. He responds back. Oh, okay. So this is how the Islam encourages that you spread the salam, as in the hadith, that spread the salam in the world. Ifsha'u salam fil alam. The Prophet used to initiate the salam himself, always. He would start saying salam alaykum. So we have to learn from Rasulullah and Ahl al-Bayt to uh, be always the first to say salam alaikum and to spread the salam towards awesome. the, the people. 99% of the thawab, huh? Goes to the one who starts who the salam first. The salam. Exactly, exactly. And 1% for the one who replied. And also another hadith, uh, let me mention and then uh, we can continue. From Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam, Allah Abu Abdullah, he said, Min at tawadu'i and to salim ala man laqeet. It is out of humbleness to say salam to whoever you meet on your way. So in the street, in the shopkeepers, anywhere you go, you will say salam alaykum. And that was the akhlaq of Ahlul Bayt and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. And even our ulama saying salam alaykum to the children. So subhanallah, we have to learn from uh, those great individuals how to say salam. Ahsan, ahsan. Salam alaykum, Shaykhna. Wa alaykum as Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Shaykhna, um, canned foods that come from all over the world we have uh, sometimes they're from Muslim countries, sometimes they're not from Muslim countries. Are we allowed to consume those canned foods that are from non-Muslim countries? If they are uh, vegetable ones, then yes, you're allowed. Okay. But if they are meaty ones, chicken, meat, then of course you're not allowed to consume because they are from non-Muslim countries. But anything comes from the Muslim countries, be it the vegetable or meaty ones or chicken ones, you're allowed to consume. The issue is only with regards to uh, the meat coming from uh, the non-Muslim countries, so you have to avoid it. Sheikh, as you know, when it comes to food, there's different methods and different techniques of you know harvesting and also farming as well, fish farming in particular. Um, here in developed countries in the West, fish farming is done in order to, you know, for, to keep up with the demand of, uh, of, of um, you know, the people. So, Sometimes the feed that they give these fish is not necessarily halal. If the fish are not being fed in a halal manner, are we allowed to actually purchase and consume these fish as well? Um, well, it doesn't make the fish haram if you give it haram food. Uh, the situation in which makes the fish haram when the fish is fed with human feces. Okay. That's the problem. And for let's say two or three days, Consecutively, mm -hmm. that's what makes this fish haram to be consumed. So, in order to make it halal uh, to be consumed afterwards, is to allow it for one full day to feed it with halal food, or the, let's say with uh, tahir food, for example, uh, um, instead of the human feces. Then it becomes 
this animal becomes uh, halal to consume and tahir. Otherwise, you have to avoid it. Okay. Sheikh, I've got a question here from the WhatsApp. A little controversial, so uh, be prepared. Uh, and for the brothers and sisters, oh, please excuse my language as the references is a bit different, difficult to discuss. But here we go. We do discuss these topics. Sheikh, uh, if one is to spend his money and um, in what we call to give fees to the brothel keeper or the owner of a brothel or indecent club such alike, what is this Sharia ruling on, on this? Of course, the money gained through this type of uh, Transaction. transactions uh, is haram mm -hmm. and the one should return this money to the original owners. Um, you cannot actually, I mean it's all, all haram in terms of setting up this type of business which is all haram. Uh, it takes the barakah, it brings uh, disease and so forth, mm -hmm. breaks up the families and so forth, crimes and, and other uh, uh, defects within this business. Uh, in Kitab Man La Yahdhruhu Al-Faqih by Saduq, yes. he mentions that it is narrated that Ajru uh, Zaniya Suht, the money that this indecent woman gains from the haram business, this haram business, is suht. Suht means severely forbidden, wow. or haram means mm -hmm. severely. You know, sometimes you say it's haram to eat crabs. Oh, yes. that's fine. But sometimes it's severely haram. Like pork. Mm -hmm. Severely haram to do this act that you actually... It's an extreme haram. You set mm -hmm. a business and transaction all in haram. That you, you, you bring uh, two individuals from opposite agenda to commit haram act mm -hmm. in return of some of money. So uh, such business, such act is absolutely haram and should be avoided and the money gained is haram. The one should fear Allah Azza wa Jal and avoid um, such uh, business and such dealings and Allah Azza wa Jal you know, provided the halal means in terms of the marriage. The one can go and get married and live their life happily. And Allah will be the razaq and the sustainer for those couple in which they get married. Even if they're poor, Allah will, uh, in the Holy Quran states that Allah will make them rich. يُغْنِهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ So the one should have hope in Allah Azza wa Jal, not the hope in the uh, Satan and his uh, Followers. Ahsant, well put. Sheikhna, the, what is the ruling in regards to looking at the private parts of other people? Well, it's absolutely haram uh, for the one to look at those uh, individuals uh, when they have no uh, proper clothing on their body. Of course, for the woman, you can't look if you're a man uh, except on the face and uh, the hands without, lost without temptation without shahwa uh, that's uh, the main issue um, but um, uh, with regard to the uh, the kitabi but in all in overall um, um, looking at the ones pri pri the private part is not permissible unless if they are uh, married couples that's the nice. exception and if it's like a baby, for example, mm -hmm. you're trying to change the nappies and so forth, yes. that's the exception. Okay. But other than that, the one should avoid. Strictly forbidden. What about here for men in the West where we have uh, non-Muslim women who don't observe the hijab? Um, so what are the limitations here for Muslim men in, in the West when it comes to women who, who are not Muslim and not practicing hijab? I think I've just answered now uh, that you only are allowed to look at the face and the hands handcuffs mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, the max you can look um, without lust without temptation without shahu that's what is allowed um, but um, as the, as mentioned but they say that as a precaution wajib precaution the one should not look at other than their faces and hands that's the precaution even without lust just to keep in the safe side so you go for an interview, let's say job, in, job interview, mm -hmm. hospital appointment, just at the face and the hands. Don't look at the rest of the body parts. I see, I see, <clears throat> I see. Shana, final question for this evening, and that's come in, and it is, what is the ruling for a halal meat animal that does not have gushing blood, such as fish, if it dies naturally? 
Um, such animals, uh, as you mentioned, the fish, if it dies naturally in the water, not being hunted by a human being, then okay. it becomes like a... Uh, it's a corpse, isn't it? Corpse, yeah, meat, uh, you can't really consume it, yeah, but it, it remains tahir. Ah, okay. Because it's not, not part of... It. You know, if you eat touch them. it, you don't have to. Do That's the fine, yeah. Wash your hands or because anything. it's not part of the animals which, with gushing blood, mm. just just the sheep, uh, the cow, and so forth. So tahir, what you can't consume. I think we mentioned last episode yeah, about okay. if you slaughter the bear towards the yes. qibla in the halal way, you can the, the skin becomes tahir. Yes, but, but the meat is you can't uh, still consume the, yeah, the meat. I remember, yes, exactly. Yes, fantastic. Thank you very much, Sheikhna, and thank you to all the viewers for joining us on this episode of Hakam SOS. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, and like today we've had some questions, may have been uh, uncomfortable, but, uh, taboo topics, but as we've said before, it is our duty to give you the answers in accordance to our maraja, our grand maraja, who are over my shoulder here. So if you have any question you'd like to ask, there's no topic silly or taboo or you know discomforting for us, we will do our best. If it is an answer you want from a certain marja, we will do our best to contact the official offices and the official representatives to get that answer for you. So if you have a question, send it in via the WhatsApp, the email address, or alternatively give us a call here in the studio, inshallah, we'll do our best to get your answer. Me and Sheikh now will be back on Wednesday night at 6 30 here on Imam Hussein TV3. Join us then for another episode of Ahkam SOS. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. We question our daily position, seeking answers and definitions. Get the queries of your chest. With Ahkam SOS